Hello everyone. Uh, most of my talks these days, they are about CrowdAI, a platform I co-founded. But today, this talk is not really about CrowdAI, but, but this talk is actually about you. So the talk is about what can you do with artificial intelligence and what can you do for artificial intelligence. These are the two main themes that I will be covering in my talk today. So let's start with what can you do with artificial intelligence. The media has done a really cool job with this. It's uh, not very easy to convince uh, anyone these days that they can do a lot with artificial intelligence. If you want to track people while they're dancing, you can do that. If you want to have a smartphone app which can detect diseases of plants or humans, you can do that. If you're an artist and you want to collaboratively paint with AI, you can also do that. You want to play games, lots of it. And yes, you can also do that. Or you can have a humanitarian aspect where you can help uh, uh, international organizations to make sense of satellite imagery and detect buildings. Or you can just generate your own uh, satellite imagery. But whenever we try to ask these questions, we are always confused. But how? How do we do it? We are always lost because this is kind of something that we read in the media, but you don't really know how to actually go out and use it in your app. But we will get back to that question. Before that, we need to quickly address what can you do for artificial intelligence. In academia, we have done a really good job at convincing that artificial intelligence is something that can be done with a lot of advanced mathematics, and unless you have these advanced skills, you are never going to do this. But I principally am here to convince you two important things today. That you can contribute a lot to artificial intelligence, more than you can think. And we, in artificial intelligence research, can learn a lot from you. And I will tell you this uh, in context of a story. This story is the story of Bob. Bob is a simulated skeleton which lives in a simulated environment. Bob came into being because of some of our own research, where we wanted to check, can a simulated skeleton learn how to walk? Bob has 18 muscles. And uh, pretty much like we humans do, all the major muscles are uh, accurately uh, represented in this uh, simulated environment. And your goal is to be like a puppeteer. Every 10 milliseconds, you send signals to all of these uh, 18 muscles and ask them to either contract or be completely relaxed. And then the problem statement is, can you basically make Bob walk or run with the notion of reward? You basically reward Bob if he covers a lot of distance. When we started playing with this uh, problem, it's a pretty hard problem in something called as reinforcement learning, which is, I'm kind of obsessed with reinforcement learning for my own research. And it's a very hard problem because of the large action space and uh, how complicated it is to search all these uh, policies. But then uh, over starting to experiment with these policies, we saw that Bob was actually learning. It was trying to do something, something funny. It didn't uh, really uh, work in the beginning. But uh, deeper into the training, it was actually taking a few steps. And there was some progress. We were really happy. But then we saw Bob is actually pretty smart. It learned how to cheat. I told it, Bob, your job is to kind of cover as much distance as you can. So in the beginning, it will take a few steps. It figured out it lost its balance. It messed up. So it does this perfect dive to just increase the reward. Like, but then we figured out some ways, and then Bob started uh, coming up with more interesting ways to uh, walk. As in, that's not how this works. Uh, we want like really good uh, human-like uh, environments, but we realized there was an issue with the uh, you know reward function. We were not penalizing it for uh, you know how much muscles you can use, or how much energy is used. But taking into account all of these things, it started doing this perfect human-like walk, and it was uh, fun, and we were happy. But then at the end of it, after a lot of work together, uh, Bob started uh, walking and running. And in fact, in these cases, in some of these examples, it was running at 4.5 meter per second. And that qualifies you for Bob Marathon. So, uh, sorry, for Boston Marathon. So if basically Bob was competing for Boston Mar Marathon, he would be qualified to go and run in the marathon. But while this is a very classic problem in uh, reinforcement learning in academia, where we researchers are also freaked out, can we even solve it? We spend months trying to do it. Uh, we actually launched a challenge around it. So this was in context of a big conference uh, uh, called as uh, NIPS. And uh, we ran a challenge uh, on CrowdAI, which is a platform where, I, where we try to make our own research accessible to anyone with a central benchmark where anyone can come in and say they have better results than us. 
So about 500 uh, participants from all around the world competed together to make Bob uh, walk and run. And about 2,000 submissions came in, and all of these needed some kind of specialized uh, skills. But the interesting part was the majority of the top participants, uh, majority of the participants and also the majority of the top participants did not have any experience in reinforcement learning at all. And they were developers, engineers who were trying to play around and figure out what is the best way to do something like this and uh, what is the best way to squeeze out the accuracy. In fact, we got a lot of really good uh, feedback. Uh, this was someone who basically responded saying he learned a lot and was very motivated in general to pick it up just because of the challenge. So he pretty much got started with a very niche area of deep learning and artificial intelligence just by playing around in context of this challenge. And in the process, he also contrib contributed back a lot to our understanding of the problem and also pushed our uh, knowledge of reinforcement learning a little bit more. But Everything is like now. Everything is not nice and flowery. We also got a uh, little uh, cruel uh, feedbacks, but these cruel feedbacks were also very um, uh, important to us. They helped us improve the environment. They helped us fix many things. They were like really good analysis of the whole environment and some pain points and uh, pain points in some of the approaches, which helped us learn and improve the whole thing a lot more. In general. This community of developers and engineers and some researchers who came together to help us uh, teach Bob how to walk and run, we really loved them all and we learned a lo lot from them. And in the process, they also learned. But how did the whole thing happen? Well, incentives are also a play. NVIDIA was uh, generous enough to give away a DGX1, which is like a supercomputer in a box. So there were like, a lot of people interested. But uh, apart from that, in general, the problem is not really that difficult. We spend a lot of time to convince our uh, participants that it's not a difficult problem and anyone can do it. In reinforcement learning, you have the notion of an agent, uh, an environment, and reward. The agent basically does some action on the environment, and the environment basically tells the agent back what the next state is and what the reward he got for this particular action. And we. In context of this, we released a starter kit where we spent a lot of time to make the problem accessible. Uh, for example, to get started, you simply have to install a Conda environment and you're already good and up and running. Then a simple starter script is something like this, where you basically have Bob at least doing something. For example, you import the environment, you instantiate the environment, then you take a single action. And if you run just these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six lines, then you basically have Bob where uh, his muscles are being randomly activated, but he falls uh, face down. But if you look at this take action um, step, the most of the thing can actually, the actual uh, action uh, being applied to the environment can be replaced by your own controller, which can be a function where uh, you can simply give out random values. or you can have a set of custom rules, which you basically say whenever the muscles are in this orientation, this is the action I need to give. Or more important than that, uh, than that you can actually put in a neural network there. Your awesome neural network, which basically models what this function is supposed to do. And that basically comes at the core of what we do in uh, deep learning these days, where you have something called as uh, universal approximation theorem, which very simply says that any function, any continuous function that you can imagine can be modeled by a very simple neural network which has just one hidden uh, layer. So this gives us the theoretical confidence to approach problems like these where we do not know what rule-based system can solve this and we try to train a neural network to do it. And in this case, we use uh, this uh, awesome neural network to do that. And how would you define, as in every time you would think it's way too complicated, I had no clue. But with a lot of the frameworks that we have, it's actually very easy to do something like that. You can st this simple block defines a very simple, um, like the baseline network which was trying to make Bob. And many of the examples you saw where uh, basically this was the agent where you can start by, and readability is also not an issue. You can start by basically taking all the action spaces and start piling up layers one after the other. And once you have all these layers, Finally, you have one black box which can somehow model what Bob can do. But this is just one example of what a neural network can look like. But here you can see a lot of these um, 
uh, a lot of these different ways in which you can combine these pieces together to make a neural network to do something that you want. And much of the research that we do is kind of to trying to find what is the optimal architecture in which I combine these pieces. It's like playing a game of Lego, where you have a lot of these pieces, and you have to be creative in plugging them in together and finding out what is the best thing that works. So coming back to this, after you have the neural network defined, then there is a little bit of reinforcement learning stuff where, which you don't really need to know. When you're just getting started, you can imagine this is just a block which has some complicated sounding de decorators which make the thing do. And at the end of it, uh, these things are some things that you will pick up once you are already motivated and starting to play with the problem. But after that, finally you actually learn by calling something like this. Now, this was the first journey that any participant or any researcher would uh, take when approaching a problem like this. And finally, after waiting for one or two days, you would get, get a graph like this, which shows that how Bob's performance increases. But in reality, everything is not as easy. So it does not really work in the first go. You realize, all right, something broke, and maybe uh, the simulation is just too slow. I want to figure out how do I make it more efficient. One of the participants came up with an interesting hack where he was training the accuracy of the simulator for performance improvement. That helped improve the graph a little bit more. Then another participant realized that I can actually run many simulations in parallel, and I can also do that efficiently, and then I merge all of them together. And that also helped increase and get a really good uh, performance out of trying to make Bob Walker run. And finally, I will just come back to this, uh, again, this fact that many of these participants, and also the one in the top of the leaderboard, were not really hardcore reinforcement learning researchers, but developers just like you, and engineers who were curious and uh, spending their free time to try to figure out how to be, uh, make uh, Bob walk by in this framework of reinforcement learning. So, but this uh, example that I gave you of Bob trying to walk is something which is very generalizable because when I say an agent, an environment, a state, reward, an action, these are very generalizable concepts. And we are uh, right now, for also for our own research and also for uh, Crowd AI, we are launching very different uh, challenges. This is something uh, called as uh, wisdom, where you have to train agents which come and compete with each other to play Doom. In a simple example, basically, it will be an agent going around in a doom environment and shooting each other. In others, many participants will submit many such agents, and they will uh, be trying to compete with each other on who wins the death match. And there also, the overall steps in getting started is still the same. You basically import the environment, you initialize the environment, the syntactic sugar might change, then uh, you basically get the initial observation, then make one random action, or it can be your own awesome neural network. And finally, then you see the whole thing moving. Then you start tweaking a little bit. Same for uh, a Minecraft challenge, where we are trying to do the same problem on how do we train agents on collaborative or competitive uh, tasks in a Minecraft uh, environment, where uh, you, at the end of it, have uh, something we call as Malmo and Marlowe. They will run around and try to build things together or compete against each other to uh, chase a pig and many other such simple tasks. The overall concepts are still the same. You set up an environment, then uh, yeah, install everything. We try to always make it very easy so you can install everything like right away. And then uh, you basically uh, set up the environment, initialize the environment, then get the initial uh, states then take an action and uh, other rewards, and then the next observation. And then, bam, you already have uh, this bot, your agent actually running around, and you see a simulation. So at the end of it, coming back to this fact that you can contribute a lot to artificial intelligence, and we can learn from a lot from you. This comes from the story of how basically Bob learned to uh, run and walk with the help of hundreds of engineers uh, all around the world. And we were also surprised on how much of this are engineering challenges and uh, challenges around writing more efficient, parallelizable code that, could have, uh, that we would have been stuck for a lot more unless we got these really varied inputs. And this large crowd out there, they are kind of stuck behind a mental block which Academy has pushed onto them, that they cannot contribute anything unless they know a lot of uh, maths or advanced uh, skills around these theoretical foundations, which is completely wrong. A lot of these things that we pick up when we are picking up a new problem in artificial intelligence research is very much like learning a new framework. You have been uh, uh, programming in procedural languages through your whole education. Then someone in university comes up and then tells you about uh, functional programming languages. And you're like, wow, that sounds good. Then our line comes in, suddenly there's a lot of news. You start playing with it. You pick up the basic constructs, some basic ideas, and you start playing and coming up with really cool stuff. And this is the same thing here, except 
These designs uh, need a little bit of effort in the beginning to understand some very basic, and not really a lot, really uh, two or three days of work, and you already have the basic intuitions behind some of these building blocks to start contributing actively. And this example that I gave you of Bob was, uh, and the other two examples were around reinforcement learning. And you already could see that how they relate to each other. But what happens when there's a new problem? This is something we are running on. You know, you have a lot of these classifiers which can be very easily fooled. So we are running a challenge where participants can act as an attacker or a defender. You submit a model which tries to fool uh, the model submitted by the defense team. And in this whole process, we get more robust systems which cannot be uh, fooled. And uh, systems like these are very important when we want to deploy these things in our everyday li life. If you have self-driving cars all around, and basically, f hacking a self-driving car would simply mean fooling the neural network into believing a stop sign is not really a stop sign. So these adversarial attacks are also very complicated. That's why you need a lot of thought from people who have been thinking about security uh, problems in general, but in a new light. Or you say something about understanding satellite imagery, which is a, a challenge we are running with uh, UNOSAT. And, uh, there the goal is, can we look at satellite imagery all around the world and did simply detect buildings? That is the first task. And in this process, basically, if we uh, can learn really efficient models with the participants came up with really imp impressive solutions, then suddenly you realize now we can map the whole world without having uh, do dozens of mapathons for targeted cities or big cities. A small city or a small village in India can also be equally um, mapped the, as a big city as, say, uh, Paris. And how do you approach a problem like this when you do not know anything like that? I have basically, over the last 10, 15 minutes, I gave you a brief primer of reinforcement learning, and I try to convince you how easy it is. We try to do that for almost all the challenges where uh, we try to make these problems from research accessible by having our own starter kit where we make the problem uh, easy to get started on, where we also give initial solutions, the baselines that uh, we write uh, for participants to get started at least with one working solution like right away. And which brings us back to the same thing, where I would just reassert that you can contribute a lot to artificial intelligence, and we can learn a lot from you. And this is something which will probably take years in trying to convince a much larger uh, crowd. But it is very important to uh, kind of pull off right, because right now, the community of academic researchers who are working on artificial intelligence is very small. So, while there's millions of really smart, talented developers and engineers who can contribute and bring a lot of value. And if at all, at one point, we want all of these solutions in our everyday life, controlling our lives, we do want to have a say in it. And each of you can have a say in it. Thank you. And um, these are the collaborators, actually, yeah, behind Crowdair. There's so many people uh, from diff oh, helping organize different challenges, many researchers who try and make all of this happen, and also many more open source contributions as uh, Crowdair is an open source uh, project. So uh, it wouldn't be possible by a single person. It needs a large number of people. And each one of you are welcome to join the Crowdair community and uh, help push uh, how artificial intelligence is uh, perceived and being used over the years to come. But before I end, I will just quickly mention another challenge, which was the AI-generated music challenge, where participants had to come up with generative models which generate music. And uh, then another crowd would evaluate how good this music was. Then what we did was, we took all the top submissions we had received, and we hired a, a group of professional musicians who would interpret this music, and then we performed them live in front of a large audience.
Thanks. Yeah.